Hello and welcome back to CCRN Review Cardiovascular Part 2. In this section, we're going to continue where we left off, talking about cardiovascular illness. In this section, we're going to talk about some conduction system defects. Now, one thing that would be a really good idea, though, is to review some of the common dysrhythmias that you see in a critical care area. Uh, these may be things that you don't deal with every day. You may not deal with uh, some of these and, and some of the ones we're going to talk about, but also some of the common dysrhythmias. You know, we probably see atrial fibrillation every day, but maybe we're not dealing with cardiac arrest and going through ACLS. So that may be something that you want to take a look at and review. First of all, let's take a look at this picture that's in your handout. And this is a diagram here illustrating what's happening with depolarization and repolarization of the heart. Now, don't memorize this. They're not going to ask you what happens in phase zero. They're not going to ask you, you know, the, the different um, types of millivolts or whatever is going on. It's just here so that you can kind of review this again, kind of remind yourself a little bit about what is going on with the heart when the heart is beating. We have electrical impulses that are going to those cardiac cells, and the electrical impulse stimulates that cardiac cell to have a change from this negative state, minus 96 millivolts, up to a positive state, of positive 52 millivolts primarily because of sodium rushing in. Then we have this state here at the top. It's kind of a plateau where we're just having some exchange of ions here including calcium and then we start pushing potassium out as we repolarize. Now the reason I'm showing you this again is because take a look at the pieces that are involved. We have electricity that's involved. There's the electrical part of the heart. If this cardiac cell was damaged or is ischemic, we're not going to be able to have a normal process going on here. If our patient has electrolyte disorders, sodium, chloride, calcium, potassium, any of those could cause problems with the patient having difficulty with this process. So as these electrolyte abnormalities occur, as damage occurs to the heart, as the heart is is stressed and stretched. All of those things are going to impact how this process works and whether or not we have normal depolarization and repolarization. Toward that end, let's talk about one of the problems, one of the syndromes that they want you to know about. So prolonged QT syndrome. So in this situation here, we have a prolonged repolarization. Now remember back from maybe a pathophysiology class or something like that, you learned that there was a couple different phases in repolarization. And I'm going to illustrate this process by using an analogy. The analogy I use is thinking about using a gun. If you were to fire a gun, that's a fairly easy process. You pull the trigger, shoot at the target, etc. And, and it's fairly easy. The hard part comes in reloading. So there's kind of two phases in that reloading process. The first phase is that you may, you know, pull the cartridge out there to start reloading. Well, at that point in time, you can pull the trigger all you want. It's not going to fire. But then as you start to put that cartridge back in, or as you start to put that bullet in into the gun, it could accidentally go off. So there's these two phases that occur during that reloading process, similar to the reloading process that occurs with repolarization. In repolarization, we have an absolute phase where it doesn't matter how many impulses you have, it's not going to fire again. It's like having the cartridge or having the bullet out of the gun. It's not going to fire with no, without having a bullet in it, right? So, but then you have that phase where the bullet is getting put back in where we could have an accidental firing. And in that phase of our cardiac repolarization cycle, we can end up having the patient go into a lethal dysrhythmia or some kind of abnormal dysrhythmia at any rate. In prolonged QT syndrome, we have a prolonged repolarization. So the period of time that we are in that possible 
moment of having something bad happen, you know, we're re reloading the gun and we're spending a long time putting that bullet in. Well, that could be a situation where we would have another impulse fall and could put the patient into a lethal dysrhythmia. Typically, this is going to be uh, one of two different methods. It's either that the, the patient just inherited it, in, in most cases will be asymptomatic until the patient has some dysrhythmias, or it could be acquired. And we see a lot of this in our patients in the hospital because our patients have electrolyte disorders and they're on cardiac medications, especially if they're on multiple cardiac medications that can lead to ending up having a prolonged QT syndrome. Hypothyroidism is another possibility. These patients are at risk for developing what's called a polymorphic VTAC, or in other words, torsades. Typically, the patient's going to end up having fainting. They could end up drowning if they were swimming and go into a polymorphic VTAC or sudden cardiac death. What we're talking about here with prolonged QT syndrome is we're talking about that measurement from the beginning of the Q to the end of the T wave. Now, you may be measuring this in your institution, and, and you might not, depending upon what kind of uh, unit or floor you work on. But measuring a QT from the beginning of the Q to the end of the T, that's illustrated here, and what that QT is. If that prolongs, that means we have a longer period where we have this relative refractory period, and the patient could have an impulse fall on that relative refractory period and cause a lethal dysrhythmia. In order to measure our QT interval and really have it be effective, we need to correct for the heart rate because the repolarization period is going to shorten as the heart rate picks up. So as you notice here, you take a look at these complexes, there's a relatively long repolarization cycle. It's, it's relatively long here. And if we were to have a heart rate of maybe 150, we'd be bouncing those QRS complexes right on the T waves of the pre preceding QRS complex. So as the heart rate starts to go up, the amount of time it takes to repolarize decreases. Again, let's think about this in the analogy of the gun. The faster you're shooting those bullets, the faster you have to reload. Make sense? So the way that we correct for that is that there's a formula you use for the corrected QT, uh, QTC is what they call it. Uh, it's called, this is the Bazet formula. There's several formulas for doing this. So you take the R to R interval and you take the QT interval and we're going to take the QT. We're going to divide it by the square root of the R to R. So let's make sure you got a calculator on hand. So here we have a QT interval here of 0.42. We've got an R to R interval of 1.16, which gives us a corrected QTC of 0.45. And this is what can happen then with that patient with that prolonged QT syndrome. The patient can end up having uh, this uh, torsades. So here you see on this 12 lead EKG that we have a normal looking beat and then uh, we go into this lethal dysrhythmia. And I, I don't know if you can see it well on your EKG, but there is a T wave there, and we're getting into that relative refractory period when the next impulse lands, and it puts the patient into this, multi, this polymorphic uh, VTAC. So watch for a corrected QT interval of greater than 0.48. I'll tell you that some references will say 0.5. Now the AACN is not going to give you a 0.49 and, and make you try and figure that out. Okay, So they're going to give you something that's obvious. Uh, so just keep that in mind. 0.48 comes from their materials from the AACN and so that's why we're using it here. PVCs, especially couplets, beat to beat variations in your T wave height, showing that we have uh, differences in how the repolarization is occurring pauses the non-sustained runs of VT and then this can deteriorate obviously into ventricular fibrillation and then the patient may have sudden cardiac death. Another type of dysrhythmia that the AACN is interested in having you learn about is called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Uh, this is a syndrome that happens in patients who have, and usually are born with, accessory pathways. So rather than just having the normal 
pathways of conduction through the heart. These patients actually have accessory pathways that also allow impulses to go down separate pathways from the normal ones. And these patients, what you might see is a shortened PR interval, and you're going to see what's called a delta wave. That's what's illustrated here on this EKG. So you see the little arrow that's pointing to the delta wave. The delta wave, and it looks like a triangle. So when you're looking at that P wave, and then you look beyond the P wave going into the QRS complex, it, uh, from the baseline, we see this movement upward that is at that angle. So in other words, instead of going right into our Q wave, a nice a nice straight up stroke, we have this kind of uh, slant and then moving into the Q wave. That's called a delta wave. Symptoms we expect to see uh, that the patient may have palpitations or tachycardia. They may have this unexplained anxiety, respiratory distress, fatigue, dizziness, and a loss of consciousness as the heart rate starts to pick up. This is an EKG that is showing the delta waves, so pick one of these leads that you want to look at and uh, take a look and see if you can find the delta wave on that QRS complex. Keep in mind that we have a normal uh, beat here and then we have a PVC. So don't look at the PVCs, look at the, the normal beat, the skinnier of the two is your normal complex and you can see the delta wave. So I see it especially in lead two, maybe a little leave one and leave three. Uh, if you look through some of the other leads, you may see it as well. Treatment is going to be, well, we take the patient over, do an electrophysiologic study. During the electrophysiologic study, hopefully we can find that particular area of that accessory pathway, and then we can ablate the pathway. Ablating a pathway is typically going to be a chemical or an electrical burn to the pathway. So we're basically killing that pathway so that the impulse will have to go down the normal conduction pathways and not spurn off into that abnormal pathway causing that tachydysrhythmia. We may also give medications to control tachydysrhythmias. Now again, this depends upon which pathway and what dysrhythmia we're getting as a result of WPW. So just a couple of the common types here that we may run into, and that is hypokalemia. Obviously, uh, we have a low potassium level. That's going to be one that we have to be aware of for the exam. And some of the pieces that we would notice with hypokalemia. Hypokalemia, now remember with hyperkalemia, you get the tall peaked T waves. Well, we get the opposite with hypo. And if you memorize your electrolytes and you just memorize one of them, so memorize the hypers, then just flip it for the hypos. The opposite thing happens. And that's what's happening here. Instead of tall peak T waves, we have flat T waves and even a prominent U wave. So the diagram here is illustrating a T. It's flipped T wave there, and it's uh, kind of small. And then we have a U wave that follows it. A U wave is a reflection of delayed repolarization. It's a reflection of delayed repolarization. This very rarely happens. The time that you may see it in a patient is somebody who has a very low potassium level, and then we might see a U wave. Otherwise, you really don't see U waves at all in your EKG. Some of the other components there are listed, and obviously we want to replace it and get that potassium level back up. Oral administration is actually better than IV. Isn't that interesting? Well, if I'm giving it IV, I'm sticking it right in the vein, right? And that's not the way the body is used to getting potassium. So yeah, that's right in the vein, and it goes right on down to the kidney, and the kidney says, whoa, too much potassium, and it dumps it off. Okay, so we're not really keeping as much as we think we are, but if we give it orally, it's absorbed in the natural way that potassium is absorbed in the body. And then our potassium level starts to go back up. So if we can give it orally, we would prefer to use that route because it is absorbed better than it is when we give it IV. Hyperkalemia, as we were just talking about, just the opposite there, we have the tall peaked T waves rather than having the small flattened out T waves. And obviously we want to treat this and get that potassium level down because either one of these, too much or too little potassium, could cause some major dysrhythmias, so we really want to be careful with that. Okay, let's move on then to heart failure. We see a lot of heart failure, 
a lot of reasons for that. One of the main reasons we see a lot of heart failure is because in the past, years ago, people would die of heart failure before we actually got to see a lot of them in the hospital. So they, some of them don't even really notice the symptoms. They just feel like they're getting old. You know, if you walk up a couple flights of stairs and you get winded, don't you just think, hey, I'm out of shape? <laughs> or, you know, maybe I'm just getting older. You know, we don't often think, oh, my gosh, I think I'm getting heart failure. Uh, you know, you don't ever hear people say that. So what happens is over a long period of time, people start to develop symptoms of heart failure, and they may not recognize them. They may not pay a lot of attention to them. So let's take a moment to think about what is happening here and what we're seeing in th this slide. We have a dysfunction of contractility, which means that over time, the contraction starts to weaken. So in order to be able to maintain cardiac output, we have to kick in those compensatory mechanisms. So that's the sympathetic nervous system, the renin angiotensin system, and aldosterone. We have to kick those things in. So those things start to kick in, and we start to see what we would consider to be the symptoms of heart failure. So let's move over to the right side for a moment and take a look at those symptoms. We see coughing, tiredness, shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, uh, the pumping action of the heart grows weaker. Well, yeah, that's the cause. Pleural effusions, swelling in the abdomen, swelling in the ankles and legs. Okay, so we're seeing all that kind of stuff. Now, let's go back and let's take a look at where those things are coming from. A weak contraction of the heart doesn't necessarily cause all the symptoms we're seeing. So where does this come from? A lot of the symptoms come from the compensatory mechanisms. So the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, it tells the heart to beat harder and faster, so we start to see an increase in the heart rate. So the patient may have just a baseline heart rate that's a little bit faster than what we would expect, maybe in the 90s, or maybe even, you know, right around 100 or the low 100s. Then we get the renin-angiotensin system kicking in to try to maintain blood pressure, and that's going to cause the patient to start hanging on to fluid. So you see all the fluid pieces there. We have the swelling, the ascites, we have the pleural fusions, we have the pulmonary edema, the swelling in the ankles and the legs. So we're getting some additional fluid that's being held in the body as a result of that renin-angiotensin system being activated. So these symptoms that we call of heart failure are really symptoms of the compensatory mechanism. And that's why the treatment for heart failure is to decrease the compensatory mechanisms. So if we block the renin-angiotensin system, the patient won't begin to start holding on to fluid. If we block the sympathetic nervous system, the heart rate will go back down. Now, if the heart rate is fast, that in itself can cause heart failure. So that symptom or that compensatory mechanism of the sympathetic nervous system kicking in and telling the heart to beat harder and faster, that's not very helpful. That's actually going to make the heart work harder than it should. So the weak contraction then ends up causing a decrease in the stroke volume, which then decreases cardiac output and causes an increase in our end diastolic pressure and our end diastolic volume. In other words, there's too much fluid backing up from the heart. So it backs up into the lungs from the left side. It backs up into the periphery from the right side. That you need to know. I'll repeat it again. From the left side, it backs up into the lungs. From the right side, it backs up into the periphery. They will ask you questions about the difference. Those things we just talked about here, the increase in end diastolic pressure and volume, will cause the heart to start to hypertrophy. Think about it like any other muscle. If you go to the gym and you start lifting weights, the muscles hypertrophy. The same thing happens here. More stress on the heart. We're telling it to beat harder. We're telling it to beat faster. That's going to cause the heart to hypertrophy. Hypertrophy in a bicep may be a good thing. Hypertrophy in the cardiac muscle is not a good thing because not only does it grow bigger on the outside, it grows bigger on the inside. And if the inside gets bigger, that means the amount of space for blood on the inside becomes smaller. Some of the etiologies for heart failure include hypertension, valvular disease, and we talked about hypertension and that being part of a compensatory mechanism for a low cardiac output state. Well, that doesn't help, does it? Because the hypertension caused by the decreased cardiac output is causing more 
heart failure. Look at the, another one on the list there, chronic tachycardia. Well, if the sympathetic nervous system is telling the heart to beat harder and faster because we have decreased cardiac output, then we're going to have a chronic tachycardia, which is going to further worsen the heart failure. So the main treatment for heart failure is let's stop the compensatory mechanisms that are making it worse. Take a look on the right-hand side here. It gives us an idea as to the progression of heart failure. Initially, it's rather silent. We have some underlying cardiac disease. We have some decreased cardiac output, but in many cases, that patient is able to compensate. If the cardiac output decreases over a long period of time, which it usually does, there's, there's usually small events that occur over a long period of time, and that decrease in cardiac output is just compensated for. So the person, instead of running, now goes out and walks, and the person who maybe who's walking a lot every day so decreases their walking distance or uh, whatever the case may be, you know, and they don't really notice anything specific. Again, a lot of times people will just say that, hey, I'm getting old. They, they place the blame somewhere else rather than thinking that there could be some cardiac disease that's occurring. When we get into that second, the initial phase there, we get some remodeling of the heart and we get our compensatory mechanisms. Again, the compensatory mechanisms are the sympathetic nervous system, the renin angiotensin system, and aldosterone. Remodeling occurs, too, on the heart. Remodeling is the situation where the heart muscle cells become injured and then they have to repair. And when they repair, they're trying to repair into something stronger so that they can overcome some of the stress that's being placed on the heart. Now this remodeling process initially is going to further weaken the heart. Okay, you know, think about it, if you get a cut on your arm, you get a cut on your arm and you get scar tissue that forms there. Now, eventually, it might be replaced by some normal healthy tissue, and we say that the scar kind of goes away. But in many cases, the scar stays, and then we have a scar there. Now, if you have a scar on the heart, that's a scar on a muscle, which means that that part of the muscle is no longer working. Then we move into progressive. That's where we start to see symptoms. So this is where we start to say, hey, this is a patient who has heart failure because they have these symptoms. And then we start to get into progressive decompensation. So some of the symptoms that we uh, associate with heart failure, the dyspnea, orthopnea, exercise, and this is one of the things that oftentimes will bring people to the doctor is that uh, they'll start to say, I can't sleep unless I sleep in the chair or unless I have lots of pillows in the bed or whatever. Uh, exercise intolerance, uh, they'll start to develop some intolerance to exercise. They go up a flight of stairs, they become winded, etc. Edema, mental status changes. An S3 and an S4. Okay, let's talk about those just briefly here. An S3 is an indication of heart failure. Now, again, I'm talking about when these are new. So if you get in reports that the patient has had an S3 and they have it in their history when they came, and th there could be a number of things that causes that valvular disease and all sorts of other things. So we, we say, okay, well, if somebody has an S3 when, when they came into the hospital, okay, well, they have an S3. But if the patient did not have an S3 or S4, and now you're hearing an S3 or S4, that can indicate something that's happening acutely. In an acute situation, an S3 indicates heart failure. In an acute situation, an S4 indicates myocardial infarction. Tachycardiorals patamegaly, jugular venous distension. So this diagram over here on the right is showing a gentleman with jugular venous distension. And you see that jugular vein filled all the way up. And, and by the way, um, the picture is a little misleading. It looks like he's sitting straight up. How we measure this is we put the head of the bed up to 30 degrees. And then we measure how much that jugular vein is full. In this case, you can see he's full all the way up to where that black arrow is. That's pretty high. That's almost to his jaw. We would call it jugular venous distension if it is anything above one inch above the clavicle. 
So you see his clavicle there? I've kind of put that little bracket right around what one inch would be. So we have the little bracket there for one inch above the clavicle. And that's where we would be looking to see whether or not the patient has jugular venous distension. And in this fact here, yeah, sure, he's got jugular venous distension all the way up to almost his jaw. So we would say, yes, that's a positive JVD. This is a picture here showing uh, there's you know a couple things we might see on a chest x-ray with a patient who has heart failure. One could be that we see the rowels and the bases. So we see the fluid accumulation that's accumulating in the lungs and it's starting in the bases and working its way up. The other thing we see is kind of a increased or a swollen vasculature. Now the heart and the lungs have a very close association. And as that blood starts to back up into the lungs, it doesn't just drip down into the bottom of the lung. It's going through vasculature, and the vessels start to swell over time when there's too much blood in the vessels. So what we're seeing here that looks like all these little roads or, or little marks that are coming off from the heart. So we're looking at one lung here. We're looking at uh, the right lung and there's the heart you see kind of a curvature of the heart over on the right side of the screen and then you're seeing all of these little lines that kind of come off of the heart or are going from the heart toward the lung that's vasculature that has swollen as a result of having too much fluid in the vasculature now if you're having a hard time seeing that then just look over into the lung itself and you see how the lung itself has has kind of got a lot of gray to it there isn't uh, that nice, clean, dark black that we like to see in the lung. So it's indicating that there is fluid backing up in the lung. We don't have the point yet where it's starting to collect in the base and work its way up, but we are having an increase in the volume of fluid that is in the lungs. To differentiate systolic from diastolic dysfunction, Let's take a look at this diagram. Now over on the left hand side, it is showing what would be a normal ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is the amount of blood that is pumped out with each contraction. So it would be really nice if the heart could contract and squeeze every drop of blood out every time it contracts, but it can't. It contracts and it pumps out maybe 65%, maybe 70, and you know, might be a good day. It pumps out 70% of the blood that's in that heart. And that would be normal. All right, let's move over to the middle where we have systolic failure. In systolic failure, failure that's the inability to be able to make a forceful contraction. Well, then the amount of blood that's pumped out goes down. Okay, that makes sense, right? And if the pump doesn't work as well, it's going to pump less. So now we're down into maybe like 35%. So to give you an idea of what's happening here in the heart, look at that middle picture. If we have 65% of the blood that got to the heart stay there and not get pumped out, and then more blood is rushing in. So what's going to happen is it's going to back up into the lungs. It's going to back up into the periphery. Does that make sense how, how that process would occur? The other thing that can happen, though, is we can get diastolic dysfunction. Now, I said systolic dysfunction was dysfunction of contraction. Systolic dysfunction is dysfunction of contraction. Diastolic dysfunction is dysfunction of relaxation. We have to have both. So take your arm and extend your arm out. Now, if you had a dysfunction of contraction, you would only be able to bend your arm a little bit, right? That, that bicep will only pull it up a little bit. You see how you have decreased work going on there? Now, if you have a dysfunction of relaxation, okay, you know, bend your arm at the elbow, so like you're, you know, making a muscle there with your arm, so it's fully contracted. Now, only relax it a little bit and then contract it again. We're still not doing very much work, are we? In diastolic dysfunction, we're able to pump out a lot of blood, 65%, so we have like a normal ejection fraction, but we started with less. Okay, if your arm's fully contracted and you only pull it out just a little bit and then push it back in, or push it, contract it again, 
you're not going to fill that with very much blood. So even though the ejection fraction is high, another way to illustrate this is I made the boxes. You can see how the boxes are. The boxes for the first two are the same size. The box for the third one for the diastolic is smaller, indicating that there was less blood in the heart to begin with because the heart could not fully relax. The other thing we need to differentiate is right-sided from left-sided heart failure. Right-sided failure is going to back up into the periphery, which is going to cause peripheral edema, jugular venous distension, and tachycardia. Left-sided dysfunction, okay, the left side is pumping into the systemic circulation, but backing up into the lungs. So we get pulmonary edema, hypotension, and S3. And the S3 is caused by blood trying to rush back into the heart. And tachycardia. So tachycardia is common to both. And what the heart's trying to do is, in either case, right-sided failure or left-sided failure, the heart's trying to compensate for the fact that it's not pumping as well as it should. So the right side backs up into the periphery, left side backs up into the lungs. So in your handout, it talks about compensation, and that's what this diagram is all about here. So let's take a look in the middle there, and we see that we have those compensatory mechanisms, the same ones that are listed in your handout. So we have our sympathetic nervous system, the renin-angiotensin system, and we have aldosterone. Let's start, though, at the top and work our way down. We have a heart that has decreased cardiac output. So for whatever reason, this patient has decreased cardiac output. Maybe they had an MI. Maybe they've had uh, some other situation that's occurred to the heart, and now they have decreased cardiac output. This is going to stimulate the compensatory mechanisms. When cardiac output decreases, we need to try to maintain blood pressure. So these com compensatory mechanisms kick in. Sympathetic nervous system, running angiotensin, and aldosterone. Sympathetic nervous system causes vasoconstriction to increase the blood pressure. Running angiotensin system helps out, causing some vasoconstriction to increase blood pressure. You notice the redundancy there? Just in case something happens to one system, we have a backup system. The running angiotensin system also causes some fluid retention to try to increase blood pressure. And so does aldosterone. So now we have vasoconstriction and fluid retention. Both of those things are being done in order to increase blood pressure. But let's go back all the way to the top and let's take a look at what is going to happen with these compensatory mechanisms. If we have vasoconstriction, that means the heart is trying to pump against a constricted vasculature. That's not going to help. In other words, our afterload increased that's not going to help. We have fluid retention. Well, the heart can't even pump what it's getting. And now we're giving it more? So that's not going to help. First, we're going to start to get edema forming, and then we're going to cause further failure of the heart as a result of all that fluid that we're retaining. In the management of heart failure, we often use things like beta adrenergic agonists. That is in an attempt to try to increase the blood pressure. So as a patient starts to decompensate, we may use a medication like dopamine or levofed in order to try and increase our blood pressure. Now, the problem with doing that is we have a heart that's failing already, and now we're telling it to work harder and faster. That's going to be difficult for the heart to do. Phosphodiesterase inhibitors also increase cardiac output. They have an advantage of decreasing afterload, which helps considerably because we're telling the heart to beat harder. And if we're beating harder against a constricted vasculature, it'll be very difficult for the heart to try to pump.
diuretics. Yeah, let's get rid of some of that fluid that the heart has been retaining, the body's been retaining as a result of those compensatory mechanisms. Vasodilators, yeah, and the same attempt. We're trying to open up the vasculature, decrease the afterload there. Calcium channel blockers, a Natricor is a, another medication that might be helpful, trying to decrease our preload and our afterload. ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, you see what we're doing there. Beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, we're blocking those compensatory mechanisms so that the heart can pump more effectively. It kind of doesn't make sense. Beta blockers and ACE inhibitors are going to drop the blood pressure, right? But if we allow the heart to pump more effectively, then the blood pressure is going to increase. So really, sometimes when you look at it, you think, geez, this doesn't make sense. It's going to drop the blood pressure when, in fact, the blood pressure actually raises when we put the heart in a better position to pump. Anticoagulation, antiplatelet drugs are possible as well to try to prevent any clots that are occurring as a result of having all of that, those uh, slow and sluggish type circulation situations. AICDs, uh, this is an important part of our heart failure treatment, is the AICD. Our patients who have heart failure are prone to developing lethal arrhythmias. In addition, the AICD may also be a dual chamber pacemaker, so an AV sequential or a biventricular pacer. The idea with a biventricular pacer is that in many cases of heart failure, the heart becomes so large as a result of remodeling and as a result of hypertrophy, that now it takes too long for the impulse to get all the way around the left ventricle. So the right ventricle fires and then the left ventricle fires. So the left ventricle doesn't have the benefit of the right ventricle pushing against it. And we can actually lose a considerable amount of our cardiac output that way. Aldosterone antagonists are blocking the aldosterone system. We may use positive pressure ventilation. It has a couple benefits. One is obviously we're going to push some of that fluid back out of the lungs, get rid of some of that pulmonary edema by increasing the pressure in the lung. But it also decreases the amount of fluid that is going to the heart and to the lungs by increasing intrathoracic pressure. So when we intubate somebody and put them on a ventilator, a lot of times you'll see in heart failure that will cause an immediate change in the patient's condition as a result of having positive pressure in the thorax. Again, the goal here is that we want to try to balance oxygen supply with oxygen demand. Our goals of therapy are to try to prevent further myocardial remodeling and damage. In order to do that, we're going to have to optimize the heart. Okay, so we can't just say, all right, well, okay, we're going to try and do that. We have to optimize the heart, and we have to optimize how our cardiac function is. So for that particular person, we have to be able to give them whatever medications are necessary to optimize their cardiac output. Otherwise, they're going to continue to develop remodeling and damage. Prevent recurrence of failure. A big part of this is making sure a patient can be compliant with their treatment. Okay, so a lot of our patients with heart failure come in and we find out they're non-compliant. Well, in, in many cases, there are reasons why they're not able to get medications and things like that. So we want to follow up on those. So hopefully we can find some way to be able to get the medications to the patient so the patient doesn't continue to have these recurrences of failure. Every time the patient goes into failure, we're causing more remodeling of the heart, we're causing more damage, and we don't want to keep doing that. Increase the activity tolerance. This is the big thing. We want the patient to be able to go home and do as much as possible. So we want to relieve as many symptoms as we can. We want to increase their activity tolerance so the patient is able to take care of themselves and able to do at least some of the things that they'd like to do when they go home. This is an example here showing a biventricular pacer. So we have a lead wire. There's our implanted CRT. And we have a lead wire that goes to the right atrium. And now we have one going down in the left or right ventricle. And then we also place the third lead over into the coronary sinus so that we can pace the left ventricle. 
So rather than just putting in the two lead system, having a lead in the right atrium and one in the right ventricle uh, and pacing the heart that way, now we're moving an additional lead over to the left side of the heart so that we can pace the right and the left side separately. This is another treatment that is often used. It's called enhanced external card counter pulsation and you'll notice what's happening here this guy has this device on and it's like the mask trousers you know it goes on the legs and it pumps up but it pumps them up sequentially so it's kind of pushing fluid back up toward the heart in order to try to try to have the body get rid of it so try and get rid of that extra fluid that is in the, the vasculature at the same time it's also strengthening the vessels in the legs so that we'll have less fluid that's retained in the lower extremities. It says beat your heart a few times. Well that's it for part two of the CCRN Review Cardiovascular System. Join me for part three.